Where are we up to? 435. We are at 73%. 73. Today, sometime today. So let me wait. Let me. I don't know. Do I not? Did it not launch soon? Here it goes. <laughs> like I will do whatever it takes. <laughs> wait. Let me. I think I'm. I think I'm. Wait, no, I'm muted. But there we go. Okay. So so we are we are at seventy three percent response rate for class. So we are super close to our five points on the bonus on the exam. This is bonus on the exam. I think, I think that it ends today sometime. So please go and do that. <laughs> okay. Okay, okay, that's good, that's good. All right, so I need, oh, I didn't start. Um. Oh, I forgot about, uh, Attendance, hold on. <laughs> I got to do the cloud. Here we go. I missed that. Sorry, y'all. Okay, and then we got to start where we left off last time. We left off. I think we were on 20. <laughs> Okay, babe. Yeah, we were working on the queue cycle, so I'm going to go back one. View full screen. Oh, but I got to do attendance. So I can't do that yet. Oh, that's not the one I wanted. Oh, my gosh, y'all. Hmm? The evaluations we just said were at 73%. 73? 73%. So we are very close. Very close. Yes, I did. Should we post like the little discussion? Okay. What do we got? This one. How many things do you have to sign into before class can start? So many. All right. So here goes attendance. Go ahead and check in on attendance when you get a chance. Okay, and let me minimize that. That was weird. Last, last class. Oh my gosh, last class. No last joke. All right, so um, <laughs> because this is because I know you all are going to go on and be so successful. So um, I'm, I'm going to tell a Boudreaux and Thibodeau joke. Uh, this is my favorite Boudreaux and Thibodeau joke. I think some people might have heard this in lab, but I really like this joke, so I'm going to tell it. So um, Boudreaux and, and Marie were married, you know, and, uh, and one day Boudreaux was watching the news and he just gets up and he goes and he walks out in his sugar cane field. And he just stands out there and uh, he won't come in. Marie can't get him to come in. So... Uh, so she calls up Thibodeau, you know, Boudreaux's best friend. She calls up Thibodeau. She says, my Thibodeau, she says, come on over. She says, I can't get Boudreaux to come inside. And uh, I'll, 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 I don't know about that, Allie, hold on. <laughs> so she says, I can't get him to come inside. She says, you go out and talk to him. See if you can talk some sense into him. So uh, Thibodeau goes out and sees Boudreaux. He says, my Boudreaux, what you doing? Boudreaux says, well, I'm, I'm, I'm in my sugar cane field. He says, why, why won't you come inside? Marie says you won't come inside. And Thibodeau says, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, Boudreaux says, he says, I was watching the news. He says, and, and they told me on the news that, that if I did this, I'd get a Nobel prize. He says, what are you talking about? He said, well, man, they told me to be outstanding in my field. <laughs> So if anybody gets a Nobel Prize, I want you to think of Boudreaux and Thibodeau. 
All right. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. That's a very good question. I will I will see if that if that math. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. So may may I'm gonna talk and I'm gonna look at who dropped and look and see who responded because I can actually go in and see that. Um but like <laughs> please everybody go in and and respond who can, right? Okay, and I wanna make sure I have, we're gonna need this one. Okay, cool, that's the one we need. All right, so let's go back to here. All right, we were talking about, and I like Mohammed's, right? Cause you take my breath away, I like that. Cause the joke was just so good, right, Mohammed? Just so, so good. All right, <laughs> y'all are y'all are uh, super super sweet to listen to my jokes. All right, so we were on complex three of our electron transport chain, right? Complex three is our ubiquinone cytochrome C oxidoreductase. So we're going to take those electrons from Q. What form is Q in right now? QH two, and we're going to in QH two is carrying two electrons, but cytochrome C can only carry one. So that's a problem. So in complex three, we're gonna to have to separate those electrons. And so that's what we're gonna talk about, how that works. The end result is that we're gonna get a reduction in cytochrome C, and we're gonna translocate four hydrogen ions or protons. They're gonna go from where to where? Negative side to positive side. Negative side to positive side, good. All right, so you gotta remember that we gotta have multiple docking sites on cytochrome on complex three. We're gonna have a docking site for QH2, and we actually have two sites for QH2 to bind, and we have to have a place for cytochrome C to bind, okay? So we have two binding sites for ubiquinone. One is on the positive side, one's on the negative side. And we're going to transfer electrons within this complex using that same iron sulfide cluster center that we've talked about in the past. And it's big. All right, so before we go through the whole process, I want to write a net equation for this just so we know what we're starting with and what we're ending with before we go through the pathway. This is for complex three? Yes, this is for complex three. So we're going to start out with QH2. Right? Now, we know we're gonna translocate four hydrogen ions. So how many hydrogen ions do I need in this equation on the inside? How many does Q have right now? Two. So if I'm gonna transport a total of four, how many more do I need? Dose, right? Okay, now. We also need cytochrome C, but remember that we're going to, well, yeah, it's gonna be cycled, right? So if we're on this side of the equation, our goal, right, is to reduce cytochrome C. So what is this form? Oxidized, right? Okay, so what are we gonna make? Q, got to regenerate Q. Four hydrogen ions on the positive side. Cytochrome C. Okay, there's one thing that we're missing from this. Tell me about Q versus cytochrome C. Q carries how many electrons? Two, cytochrome C carries. So how many cytochrome Cs do I need? Two. Okay. So it's important to know what we need to go in and what's gonna come out before we look at the pathway, right? We good on this? All right, so now the Q cycle. Our whole goal is to convert that two electron transport process into a one electron transport process. 
Okay, so we're in complex three. Just to remind you, we are in complex three and we're gonna get out of this reduced cytochrome C. Okay, so how does this work? The first thing that's gonna happen is QH2 is gonna come in and it's gonna bind on the negative side, on the positive side, sorry, not the negative side, the positive side. So you have OP, see that's one binding site, and ON is the second binding site. So the first thing that's gonna happen is QH2 is gonna come in here at the OP pocket. Q, oh, why, did I, why do I say O? Oh, Q, Q, thank you, Q pocket, all right? So this one's carrying how many electrons? Two, all right. So when those two electrons leave, what's gonna happen is we're gonna transport two hydrogen ions into the inner membrane space to the positive side, right? That's half of our protons, that's great. So those electrons are gonna get split up at this point. One of them is gonna get carried in an iron sulfur system that we've seen before, no big deal, right? along with some cytochromes, eventually it's gonna to get to cytochrome C. Cytochrome C is gonna take that one electron and it's gonna to go to complex four. But we got another electron we have to worry about, right? This one electron is gonna to go to heme. So these are heme groups that are gonna pick it up, heme. So the second single electron goes to heme. Okay, so when that happens, what you're gonna get is that this oxidized Q, right, is gonna move from the, the P pocket to the N pocket. moves to the end pocket, to the Q end pocket. So when it's sitting here, do you see how it's got that weird, it's got that weird writing next to it. It's the Q dot negative. That's the semiquinone. You know what that? That means that it's got only one electron, right? Okay. So while this is happening, while this is happening, you're gonna have a new QH2 come in and it's gonna to bind to that now empty pocket. This is why it's important that this complex have two pockets because you're gonna need two QH2s to make one basic circuit, okay? So that new QH2 comes in, it's going to split those electrons, right? You'll pump two hydrogen ions into the inner membrane space one of those electrons will go to cytochrome C, the other electron will follow the heme, right? Do you see what's happening? This is how we're gonna get four hydrogen ions to go, right? It's gonna take basically two cycles for that to happen. Yeah? Okay, so, so when, the Q, when the second QH2 comes in and starts that process happening, you have gotta remember that this semiquinone is still occupied right here in the uh, QN pocket. Right? So the last thing is that this electron that comes along in the heme from really the second QH2 is gonna reduce this semiquinone to regenerate QH2. The electrons here, mm -hmm. they're gonna come in, you have hydrogen ions that are gonna come in from the negative plus the electrons that came in from that second QH2. Quinone to QH2. Correct, correct. So for each QH2, you're only gonna pass on one of those electrons. So it takes two QH2s to then make two cytochrome Cs. Right? So, so you, see, you see how that's splitting up those electrons to where we had a two electron carrier system and now we have a one electron carrier system. 
Yeah. Okay. And so once that second QH2 um, gets oxidized, this Q here is going to get released into the membrane and then can be used again. And it'll shuttle back, pick up some more, and come back. And it just keeps going on and on and on and on. Right? Okay. So these are these are just some some cytochrome structures. So remember when we said if you have um, red meat, if you have uh, dark meat and white meat, what does that mean? You have more mitochondria. What inside of the mitochondria is going to give that color? Your cytochromes. You have some that are embedded inside of the membrane, inside of the complexes that can't go anywhere. And then you have some that are mobile. Which one's mobile? Which kind of cytochrome is mobile? Give you a hint. Aha, cytochrome C. Cytochrome C is mobile. So this one right here is mobile. These two are embedded in the membrane. And so they have those iron clusters inside of them. And so you can convert between Fe2 plus, Fe3 plus, and you can um, oxidize and reduce that way. And this cytochrome structures are super, super, super conserved. Super conserved. Mm -hmm. so that means like they part of the want chain. They're part of what? They're not, yeah, they yeah. don't change very much. From species to species, they really don't change very much. Yeah, the only difference is like the only difference. Conserved like, means uh, that your DNA sequence is highly similar to another species DNA sequence. Okay. All right, so on to complex five, four. Ooh. Complex four, right? Okay, what's the last thing? We've got our cytochrome C. Now it took us, it's gonna take us two cytochrome Cs, right? Because we only picked up one at a time. All right, so now it's gonna, complex, Four is going to accept those electrons one at a time. Even though we say this is two, right? It's really going to happen one at a time. So I don't like the way they show it. I wish they would show two molecules, but it's okay. Yeah, they're showing what happens overall, but it's hard to understand a mechanism if you're only looking at it overall. You know, one electron at a time, one electron at a time. So when we move those electrons along inside of complex four, the end result is that those electrons are gonna do what to our oxygen? Reduce our oxygen into water. No, no. You should know the general types of electron carriers inside of these um, complexes, but you do not have to know the sequence. Oh my goodness, no. So you're going to move two hydrogen ions from this inner, from this matrix space to the inner membrane space, right? So we got another two hydrogen ions. So how many electrons do we need to actually reduce one molecule of O2? Four. That's exactly right. We need four electrons to reduce one O2. So that's why we draw this reaction like this, where we say two H plus N plus a half O2. Does a half O2 actually exist? No, but everything else goes that by. Be a single, wouldn't that just be a single oxygen though? It, no. In order to write a single oxygen, what would you write? I'm, I'm just making, I'm just. Four H plus N plus one O2 goes to what? Two H2O, right? And no, then. Like a single, like, oh, not like, no, not O2, like it's like, oh, and then just an O. Oh. oh. I'm just pointing out what I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to reinforce why you say that's not, that's impossible. But. Yeah. Okay. So what do you, what are some big picture take home things from all of these complexes, right? 
what part of the mitochondria do all of the complexes have to interact with? The matrix, and some of them interact with the inner membrane. So they're all gonna have functional groups that are going to face the matrix, right? All of them will have functional groups that face the matrix. Let me, uh, so all. Ace matrix, right? But some of them are gonna have some functional groups that face the inner membrane space. Which ones? Which ones? Also have functional groups that face inner space. I'm just gonna say inner space. Well, which com you tell me which complexes? Four is one of them. And three. Why? Because of cytochrome C. So if we start with the oxidation of one NADH, and we're starting at complex one. What do we result in? We're gonna, we're gonna, well, yes, but, but like, what's our goal of going through the electron transport chain? To pump those hydrogen ions to make an electrochemical gradient. So we're gonna actually pump 10 hydrogen ions for every one NADH molecule from the matrix to the inner membrane space. Okay. All right. So that's NADH. How about FAD, FADH2? It does bypass. Okay. So we're going to skip complex two. And so we're gonna make less, we're gonna pump less hydrogen ions. How many are we gonna do if we skip complex two? Complex two pumped how many? Four, so we're left with six. I'm just gonna say N to P, <laughs> shorthand, N to P. Oh, so we six hydrogen ions. Mm -hmm. six hydrogen ions. It's not going to cause it's not going to cause hydrogen ions to pump. Only NADH is going to cause hydrogen ions to pump through complex two. Complex two. You you skip two complex two. Oh, because two doesn't have to change. Right. You bypass complex one. You're skipping two complex two. You're skipping two complex two. So you're losing the four that came from complex one. Yes. Well, well, no, you have to go through two. You have to, you're skipping complex one to get to complex two so that you can go and then pump hydrogen ions in complex three. When you get to complex three, how many are you pumping? Four. When you get to complex four, how many you're pumping? Two. So two, four, two. Two, zero, four, two. Four. Four. I'm sorry. Four, four, and two. That's complex one, complex three, and complex four. Three does nothing. It's not that it does nothing. It's not that it does nothing. <laughs> it just so doesn't pump our, our ion. Complex one produces four hydrogen. So. Correct. Correct. Yes. All right. So we're just we're we're just sorting hydrogen ion pumping. So you just kind of have to go in and summarize that kind of track. No, skip two complex two. Okay. 
<laughs> Bypass complex one, start at complex two. Okay, all right. So y'all y'all need to go over and, and look at those diagrams from the beginning. It's because we split the day. It's because we split the day, it's hard. Yeah. What's happening, yeah. So, so how efficient is this process is the question, right? So you have two different effects. You are changing the pH and you're changing the potential, the electrical potential, right? On one side of the membrane and then the other. Um, and so you have to look at the effect of both of those on the actual delta G value, right? Um, if you if you looked at delta G not prime, you would get something that's like minus 220 kilojoules per mole. You are not going to have to do a calculation using this formula on the exam. I knew that was going to be a question, so I'm telling you now. What? Don't memorize it. You don't. You, well, yeah, like that. It depends on both pH and it depends on electrical charge, right? And so we're, we're taking in those two things in our formula to calculate the actual delta G. Okay. All right, so basically we're saying the delta G of the product requires, requires these above delta pH and delta, whatever that is. Charge, psi, but it's charge. So what you actually get out of this is negative 152 kilojoules per mole. So pretty good. You got to say that's pretty good. It's a very spontaneous reaction. Yeah, and this is this is really um, per right NADH molecule or per ten hydrogen ions. However you want to think about it, right? Or ten hydrogen ions. And most of this energy that we get, this negative one hundred and fifty-two kilojoules per mole, really comes from. Um, our, our charge difference in the membrane, not so much the pH. Really, it comes from um, the charge ratio. But I'm not going to make you know the math behind it. Don't. Like a, a variation of the formula that we looked at in the chapter? Yeah. Like a, like a well, transporter? Was. I think it was, it was like a transporter. Like concentration units or it, yes, but in this case, it's the charge of the membrane instead of the concentration of the substrates. Yes, exactly. Okay, so moving on, right? Moving on. Our last structure, and it used to be called actually a part of the electron transport chain. It used to be um, complex five, but uh, it's no longer called complex five. It's, it's called its own, um, its own separate thing. We call it ATP synthase, right? So ATP synthase is one of the most essential protein machines in every single cell. ATP synthase. So we're going to look at how the protein is arranged, and then we're going to look at how those protons make ATP synthase make ATP. Okay, so we divide the ATP synthase protein into two large structural components. F1 is our catalytic activity. So here, down here is F1. So F1 faces our our matrix, right? Because we are, are we more like bacteria or more like yeast? Yeast, yeast we're eukaryotic, right? So this is really us. And so we are facing the matrix. Okay. So this is where we're gonna be actually taking ADP on our inorganic phosphate and turning it into ATP. This F1 region, I'm sorry, this F0 region acts as our proton channel. So do you see this gray, like, it almost looks like a crescent shape? That's gonna contain a pore that's split in two, 
that allows for the hydrogen ions to get pumped from the inner membrane space back to the matrix. So wait, so F1 is where the is the where it's actually made and where the ATP is actually made. And F1 is where the ATP is made. That's correct. And then F0 is our inner membrane embedded in the membrane contains the proton channel that allows for the translocation of those hydrogen ions from the inner membrane space to the matrix. So basically, F1 is what allows ATP to travel from, from membrane. Not ATP, protons. It allows protons to travel. F1 is the head. No. Oh, yes, F1 is the head. Sorry. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, I'm, we're still talking about this one. F1 is the head. This is the head. Yeah, well, and, and there's another part. We're going to divide it into three parts in just a second. We're going to split it. So, mm -hmm. so let's talk about, let's talk about those, those pieces, right? Okay, so if we take this molecule and we break it up into three pieces, inside of our catalytic area, right, we have two things. We have really the headpiece. This, this is what really contains the catalytic activity. So this is alpha three, beta three. So what kind of, what do we call that? Well, I was thinking hexameric, right? Remember when we were naming those, right? A hexameric um, complex there. So each one, and we'll go through the animation but there are three different sites inside of the headpiece that have to undergo conformational changes in order to make an ATP. So there are three different places in the headpiece where you can make ATP. Now, how do you make this change? You have to induce some kind of conformational change. So what's gonna happen is protons are gonna come in to this gray piece right here. And when they come in, that's going to make this blue circular rotor piece move. What is this rotor piece connected to? We have the, when the protons come in to the channel, it's going to make the rotor move. The rotor has this ring structure that's embedded in the membrane, but it also has a piece that extends down and actually goes through the middle of the headpiece. So do you see, this is the gamma subunit right here. Do you see, here's that same part of the gamma subunit. Where's the rest of the gamma subunit? Like if this is a flower, right? This gamma subunit goes into that center of the flower, right? And the, the alpha, beta are, are like petals on the flower, right? That's how I kind of think about it. All right, so when this rotor moves, do you see how one side of it, there's nothing, and then another side of it goes down? As it moves, it's going to basically bump every single one of these subunits and induce conformational changes as it moves. It's really cool. We're going to watch an animation. It's awesome. All right. Well, that's great. This guy's going to move. What do you need this to do then? Do you want it to move? No. No, I want it to stay stationary. And then as my gamma subunit comes in, and it's like a, like a mixer. Right, it kind of kind of goes around like a mixer. Well, you have to hold the bowl still, right? So the mixer can go. So what you have to have is a stabilizing arm that basically holds on to it. And so that's the stator. This is a part of an engine that prevents movement, and they also call it a stabilizing arm. So the actual channel is in the stator. So you have half of it here and then it kind of like curves and it goes, the hydrogen ions go into this little rotor and they, they go around in a circle. <laughs> then they come back and then you have a second channel that allows those hydrogen ions to come out. And it's gonna, it's gonna look, you're gonna understand it more when you see the animation, which is the very next slide. So this is where the actual channel, channel is? The channel is in the gray piece. The channel is in the gray piece. Okay, so y'all ready to watch the little animation? Because it's gonna make so much more sense when you see it in action. It, this is like one of my favorite proteins in action. So um, let me minimize some of this. I, 
I'm going to minimize the chat, I think, just while the animation is going. So hang tight. <laughs> Oh, I don't have sound. Hold on. Hold on. Large structural components. I'm going to rewind it. Which includes Wait, let me rewind it. Okay. The mitochondrial ATP synthase complex consists of two large structural components F1, which encodes catalytic activity, and F0, which functions as a proton channel crossing the inner mitochondrial membrane. In yeast, the mitochondrial F1 component consists of three alpha subunits, three beta subunits, and one each of gamma, delta, epsilon, and or CP subunits. The F0 component in these contains one A subunit, two B subunits, and 10 C subunits. It's useful to think of the ATP synthase complex as three functional units. The rotor, made up of gamma, delta, and epsilon subunits and the C subunit ring, rotates as a single unit. The catalytic headpiece, containing a hexameric arrangement of three alpha and three beta subunits, synthesizes ATP. And the stator, which consists of the A subunit embedded in the membrane, and an immobile stabilizing arm made of the B, D, H, and OSCP subunits. The F1 component's beta subunits each contain a catalytic cell that can catalyze the formation of ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. At any given time, each catalytic site is in a different conformation and has a different affinity for ATP. This results in one site generally being empty, called the open conformation, one occupied by ADP and inorganic phosphate, called the loose conformation, and the last one, referred to as the tight conformation, being occupied by ATP. The rotation of the gamma subunit causes a change in conformation in the beta subunits. As the gamma subunit rotates in a clockwise direction, the beta subunits undergo sequential conformational changes, each going from loose to tight to open conformations. Note that when viewed from the matrix, the gamma subunit of the intact complex appears to rotate in a counterclockwise direction. In the yeast mitochondrial ATP synthase, each 120-degree turn of the gamma subunit is powered by the movement of approximately three protons through the F0 subunit. How does proton movement cause rotation of the gamma subunit? The two-channel model proposes that the A subunit contains two half-channels that provide access to the C subunit ring from either the intermembrane space or the mitochondrial matrix. According to this model, a proton from the intermembrane space where proton concentrations are highest, first enters the half channel. The proton then comes in contact with a negatively charged aspartate 59 residue in the C subunit. The proton neutralizes the negative charge, allowing the C subunit ring to rotate in a clockwise direction when viewed from the intermembrane space. On the other side of the C ring, a proton bound to an aspartate 59 of a different C subunit gains access to the second half channel and enters the mitochondrial matrix where proton concentrations are low. Using this extraordinary protein machine, cells are able to harness the energy of the proton gradient to drive the synthesis of ATP. Isn't that really awesome? Like, that is so cool. All right. Um, yeah. All right. So we watched our animation. All right, so let's let's kind of that's kind of a lot of information all at once, right? So so let's talk about this. Most of the things when things change, it's due to a conformational change, right? And so we have our protons that are flowing through that that F zero component, right? So they they came in the channel, right? They came in the channel, and then the channel kind of curves, and they get picked up. They get picked up by one of those aspartate residues that's negative, right? And each one has an aspartate residue and can pick up one proton. And so that turning, every time it picks one up, it makes a little turn, right? And so the motor's got to rotate in order to make your F1 component, your alpha beta subunits change. These are all mitochondrial matrices, or what, what, what they call like these, these that catch the electrons, or 
catch the electrons. Right. They go down to the channel into the, into the protons. Room. Protons. Protons. H plus. Right. So that's going to change. That's going to make our our motor turn, and then they're going to come out of the motor and they're going to go down into the matrix. Right. So they came from the intermembrane space. They go through, they get picked up, and they get dropped off. Those protons are done, but what's going to induce the changes in the alpha and beta subunits? Your gamma, right? Your gamma is going to come down, and it's going to sit in the middle of all of these alpha and beta subunits. And it's going to induce those conformational changes. And so it's these changes. Oh, and I didn't turn my chat back on. I'm listening, y'all. Sorry. OK. It's these changes in the alpha and beta subunits that actually catalyze the formation of ATP. So we have to go through one of three different conformations, right? We're going to start with loose. It means it's basically empty. Then it'll be tight. And then it'll be open. Okay? So the rotor is going to rotate 120 degrees for every change of conformation. So if you have three conformations, 120 times three is what? 360. Yes, 360. Okay. So when we go 360, we're going to make one ATP. Right? Okay. So the ATP, so you, you're, you've basically got nothing in the loose. Then in the tight, you're going to bind ADP and PI. It's the catalytic subunit alpha beta that, regula that rotates 120 degrees. So it's the headpiece? Yes. Okay. So we got nothing in loose. We're going to bind ADP and PI. We're going to form ATP. And then we're going to open it up and we're going to release ATP. Yeah, watch. Let me, let me go to the next one. Okay. So here's our three different conformations, right? So let's pick one of our beta subunits because the beta subunit is where everything basically binds. So we're going to start in the loose. When we're in loose, we're going to bind ADP and PI. What happens when we go from, we're going to look at just this one. This one is in loose. What happens as this rotor in the middle moves is that this same subunit, it's not going to go anywhere. It's not going to move. It's going to change conformations. It's going to go to the tight conformation. So what happens in the tight conformation? Basically, you can think about it like kind of squeezing things together and hooking that inorganic phosphate to the ADP, right? So now we've, we've got it bound, but it won't let go. So in order to let go, we have to induce a new conformational change. That new conformational change is right here. It's the open conformation. When we get to the open conformation, now we can release that ADP. And now we're primed to guess what? Enter the loose again and bind another ADP and PI. So we release the ATP. So it takes 360 degrees to release an ATP. It depends on what you, if you're looking at it from top or bottom. <laughs> so if your perspective changes, um, so this, this view is from the matrix side. So like you're looking underneath it, right? Yeah. Okay. So we said a full rotation, one subunit will generate one ATP. So if I look at three subunits and all three undergo a complete revolution, what are you going to make? three ATP. So it takes about nine hydrogen ions, about nine hydrogen ions to make three ATP.
but it's really not perfect. And about one third of the time, you actually need four hydrogen ions to make that 120 degree rotation. So in actuality, in actuality, you need 10 hydrogen ions in order to make three ATP. So it's not a perfect system, but gosh, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Why is it less uh, one third of the time, you need four hydrogen ions to make that conformational change, right? Because it's not an equal number of, um, you actually have 10 of those little subunits in the ring, right? And so it, it doesn't work out. The math doesn't quite work out. But when you look at the kinetics of it, about a third of the time, you need that extra, sorry, hydrogen ion to make the conformational change go. So you, it's about 10 hydrogen ions per, um, per three ATP. So the three ATP is coming from one ATP per beta subunit, yes. Per beta subunit, yes. Now, how fast do you think it goes? Really quickly, really quickly. It goes 130 revolutions per second. Right? Like that's insane. 130, that's insane. So they were able to visualize this. I thought this was a really, really cool experiment where they linked, um, they, they took just the catalytic subunit, right? If you wanna know how quickly this is happening, they took just the catalytic sub, subunit and hooked it to a slide. And then they took the gamma subunit and hooked it onto an actin filament that you can actually put a fluorescent tag on this actin filament, right? And so it'll fluoresce so you can actually see it. And so what you can see is this little like tail whipping around in order to count the revolutions. So it's, it's kind of a cool, um, a cool experiment where you can actually see that. And you can actually, so depending on what you do, if you um, actually attach a magnetic bead to here, what you can actually do is you can make it go in the opposite direction. So if it rotates in the opposite direction, what do you think is going to happen? Yeah. It's hooked to the slide. It can't go anywhere. Yeah, not well, what are you, when you're going in the correct direction, what are you doing? You're making ATP. Go in the reverse direction. What's, what are you doing? You're hydrolyzing. Correct. So if you rotate in the opposite direction, you hydrolyze. If you rotate in the correct direction, you generate. It's really cool. If they made it what? That's terrifying. Well, so what they have to do, they, what they have to do is hook a magnet to, to the, the gamma subunit, and then they have to put a magnet on the bottom, and then right move the magnet on the bottom, which pulls the magnet on the top. So you have to put energy in to make it happen, you know, because you're, you're hydrolyzing you're ATP. But, all right. You produce, you, you, when you say you rotate the correct way, you, you make ATP, you rotate in reverse, you hydrolyze ATP. It's cool. It's cool. So you got to think about, in order for all of this to happen, right, we, we have to, make sure that all the components are where they're supposed to be. So you have to worry about transporting your ATP, your, your ADP, your inorganic phosphate, all of that is required in order to make this work. Um, you also have to worry about shuttling in your NADHs that came from like glycolysis, right? You know, we've talked about in the citrate cycle, we've talked about all those NADHs that are made, the FADH2 that's made, but we really kind of left that NADH that was made in glycolysis. You remember that guy? We left him behind because he's in, um, he's, he's not in the mitochondria, right? So we have to find some way to shuttle um, that molecule into 
into the system so that we can harvest those electrons from glycolysis. So when we're in the citrate cycle, we're in the mitochondrial matrix, right? We're, we're right next door to the, uh, the electron transport chain, no big deal. But when we have cytosolic NADH, we need carrier molecules that are going to actually move them. Yeah, cytosolic is glycolysis. Because you're trying to regenerate your NADH pluses. You're trying to regenerate so that you can continue to go through glycolysis. Yes. Yes. Okay. So we have a cytosolic NADH that's made from glycolysis. It's going to have to get transferred to carrier molecules in order to get to the electron transport chain. And there are two different shuttles. There's the malate aspartate shovel, shuttle, which is in the liver. And then there's the glycerol 3-phosphate, which is in the muscle. Glycerol 3-phosphate is not as effective. You get less. You get like three ATP per NADH. Here you get five ATP per NADH. Yeah. So why in the muscle would you want one that only makes three ATP? It's quicker. It's quicker. So this is fast. This is fast and this is relatively slow. So muscle contraction, right? When you're running, when you, you want to very quickly, right? Right, because you, you need it. You're going to use it up very quickly. So, so even though you get less out of it, it's going to go faster. So this is why when you look at those totals, okay, I'm going to start with one molecule of glucose. How many ATP am I getting out? Right? It's a different number. You know, it varies. This is, this is where some of that variation comes from, okay? So it depends on what cell type you're in, that kind of stuff. So let's talk real quick about um, ATP and ADP transport first. So we have two translocase proteins. There is one that exchanges an ATP for an ADP, right? So what kind of a transporter is that? Antiporter an antiporter. And then you have a phosphate translocase. This is either a symporter or it's an antiporter. A-N-T, oh my gosh, antiporter. <laughs> um, it depends on what it's doing. So let me show you the two. All right, so um, they, they, this one is our, our antiporter for ATP and ADP. Um, and so when we talk about this one, there are different states. So depending on the conformation of the translocase protein depends on what it can bind to. So you know when ADP is in its, well, when the molecule is ADP, right? How many negative charges do you have on it? Three. Three. When you're in the ATP form, how many negative charges do you have? Four. Four. An overall net charge on the molecule, right? So, so there are different affinities depending on the um, conformation and charge of the, the molecule. So in the C state, where we're open to the inner membrane space, it has an affinity for ADP. ADP will come in and bind It'll change conformations to the M state. The M state will release the ADP because it doesn't like it anymore because it's in the wrong conformation. Oh, but now we really like ATP. So then ATP can come in, bind here, and then it's gonna induce a conformational change. That conformational change brings it back to the C state and then ATP can be released. And then another ATP can bind, yeah? Mm -hmm. And they figured this out using different um, uh, inhibitors. So you could inhibit uh, binding of ADP 
or you can inhibit binding of ATP. So we knew that there were two different conformations because of that. This is for all for the anti-porter. Oh, it doesn't, you don't have to know. You don't have to know which one inhibits what. You do not have to know that. Don't memorize that. Okay, so our phosphate translocase can either be a symporter where it takes that inorganic phosphate. This is, this is really PI, right? That's how we abbreviate it. And we can transport it together with our hydrogen ion, but this is gonna be a neutral transaction. So we have a negative and a positive, right? Or we can bring in a PI by exporting an OH minus. What's the net charge change? Either one is no charge difference. So it's electrically neutral translocation, right? A negative in and a negative out, you haven't had a charge change. A negative in, a positive in, you haven't had a charge change, okay? What do you mean, would it occur more if it's neutral? No, it depends on the relative concentrations of um, protons and hydroxide ions. It just depends on. Well, it, it, and it, it does depend on the activity of everything prior. Yeah. And have a PI come out. So, so you can have a, a PI and an H and a, pro, and a positive proton go in, or it can have, or it can have a PI go in and a, and a negative. It depends on the concentrations of the hydrogen ions and the hydroxide ions. That's what it depends upon. So you got to think all of these things are dependent upon one another, right? So if you're going to make one ATP, what do you need? You're gonna to need to pump in one inorganic phosphate. How do we pump in one organic phosphate? Cost us what? One hydrogen. one hydrogen ion. So we had to pump one hydrogen ion in here. Now, how many hydrogen ions had to go through our ATP synthase in order to make one ATP? Three. So how much does it cost us to make an ATP? It costs us four hydrogen ions per ATP going from the uh, positive to the neutral. So, All right. So the whole, the whole thing, the whole reaction requires four hydrogen ions. So that is the end of what we're going to cover on the exam. So right there is where we stop. And if you're gonna take the next biochemistry, stay tuned, yay. Um, and we'll pick up kind of where we left off. That's kind of a nice thing about just going from one to the next, you know, uh, but that's it. You made it. All right, so I will take questions now. Mohammed, you wanna, ooh, let me turn it down a little bit. You wanna talk or you can type, up to you. Does in the case, what do you mean? Does electrons in the case of ATP? Well, where did you get, how did you get those hydrogen ions in the, right. So how did you get those, those hydrogen ions over here in the intermembrane space? That cost you electrons. So in order to get a certain number of hydrogen ions into this intermembrane space, you did have to pay in electrons. Yes. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, that's how you made that gradient. The only way that you're gonna have a higher concentration of hydrogen ions here, in order for them to diffuse through these different um, transporters is to have them pumped through the um, electron transport chain, which cost you electrons. Okay, Tristan, what you got? And you can talk or you can type.
for the lab. Hold on, it's too loud. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. For the lab. Uh -huh. um, for the video, it kind of cut out when you were supposed to calculate um activity, and it says you need you need moles right per minute. But how do we get moles when we're we only have grams? I mean, do we have to look up molar masses for the different fractions? Where did write down write me down the time that it went out and okay. email that to me? I didn't know it went out. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, but I'll have to look. I'll have to look at where you're talking about in the in the Excel spreadsheet. Like I can't without looking at the Excel spreadsheet. I, I can't. Yeah, that's understandable. Okay. Yes, right. you do need a calculator for the exam. You do need a calculator for the exam. But yeah, I'm happy to, um, if you send me the question and send it to me, I, I can make a little quick video fix and, uh, and send it out to y'all. I think I know the one that I was wanting to talk about. No, there will be no respondents. There will be no respondents. Oh, for the lab exam. Oh, 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 for the lab exam, I will, I don't, now I will activate the calculator for my students. I will try to help Dr. Smith activate the um, the calculator for his exam, but I cannot make any promises for him. Okay. So I if you can have a calculator. You need a calculator. Right. So I would say make sure you have your own calculator, and if for God forbid something happens to your calculator, you have the respondents one as a backup. Right. Do not depend on it. No, no, no. I'm going to use my calculator. Yes. Yes. They are on my YouTube channel, and I accidentally posted them in the forum, in the announcement forum on, um, on the lecture. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, I'm sorry, Gracie. Uh, no, I didn't know how far we were going to get. So the animation self-check doesn't count, but we actually went through ATP synthase. So it would be a good thing to do. It would, it's not gonna count because, because I didn't know quite how far we would get and I didn't wanna make it dependent and then we didn't cover it. If you what? If it, wait, wait, is it okay if it what? No, it's not going to count again. It's not going to count. But the other one the other chapter 11 and everything between chapter 11 and chapter seven, mm -hmm. that was a self-check counts. Right, the animations. The animations count except for chapter 11 because I didn't know how far we were gonna get. So on that, uh, like, for, 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 chapter, for chapter 11, self-check is all have a good like, Me too. Are they gonna be getting all breaks? Are they gonna be getting all breaks? Is it the fact that there's no, no, just do the best you can. You got three attempts, get with some people and you're gonna be able to get it. Okay, any other questions on Zoom before I let us go? Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and end Zoom. If y'all have any questions, send me an email and I will work on whatever happened with the video. So Tristan's going to email me, right? Who else is still on? Okay, anything else? What's the last day is sad? Yeah, and I know last day of class, it is sort of sad. All right, peace out. Good luck studying. Y'all will y'all will be good. Good luck. I will see you in Pelche Auditorium. Pelche Auditorium. Wait, Dr. B. Yes. Okay, so I was just wondering to like, you're gonna check to see if the people who dropped. Yeah, I'm gonna go in and see if it's counting just the people who are active or if it's also the people who have dropped. There's a way for me to check that. But I think Ginger is pretty high. <laughs> I hope it is. I really, really, really hope it is. Okay, I was just. I was just thinking about that. Yeah, no, that's a great point because I didn't think about that. And um, and I'm going to double check and make sure as to what it's dependent upon. Okay, thank you.
So I will make it to, to where it is 80% of the people who are currently active in the class. Yes. All right, anybody else? Good. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and in the the in the the Zoom. <laughs>